and welcome to Instant Transmission, a podcast where we discuss everything Dragon Ball and some things that aren't Dragon Ball. That's right, tonight's episode is a bit of a change from the norm as we take a side trip over to Toriyama's recently released anime, Sandland, in honor of the legend himself. Though we don't plan on covering non-Dragon Ball content very often, we felt that this was appropriate for us, so hydrate up and burn some sage because we're about to enter the demon-filled desert. I'm your host, Dayton, and once again, I'm joined by my co-host, Todd. Hi! And like I said, tonight we'll be covering Sandland, the series, episode 1 through 6. And again, we're going to be going over roughly the first half of the series, since the whole thing is about 13 episodes long. Just to cover some basic points and dispel any confusion, Sandland was originally released in a, as a single-volume manga in May of 2000. In August 2023, the Sandland movie was released, and then earlier this year, in March of 2024, the anime was released, titled as Sandland, the series, which is what we'll be covering tonight. And with all of that covered, was there anything you wanted to add before we got things started, Todd? I think that covers most of it. I'm I'm excited to cover a, a different media that uh, Toriyama made himself. It's it's interesting to see what they did with a single volume manga and turning that into an anime and even kind of expanding it. Uh, but beyond that, I'm just excited to talk about this one. Oh, uh, we do have one more thing we should bring up is that um, we had not talked about whether we were watching the sub or the <laughs> dub. And um, I was... Uh, under the impression that this was a brand new anime, so I didn't even bother looking for the dub. So I may have watched it in the dub, and I believe, Todd, you watched it as sub? Or vice versa that. I'm sorry. Yeah, the inverse. So so Dayton watched the Japanese dialogue uh, with subtitles, and I watched the English dub without subtitles. Uh, I, I watched it that way because we normally watch the dub for Dragon Ball, and I figured the dub was going to be easier for Dayton as well. And Dayton kind of thought that there wasn't a dub out, uh, and I failed to let him know ahead of time that there was, in fact, a dub. So it'll actually kind of be fun in this way, because we'll kind of get to do a little bit of comparing and contrasting of the the voices and maybe even some of the character names and possibly even some of the writing. So it'll be kind of an interesting little experiment. Yeah. And in the future, we might flip flop. I don't know. We haven't just talked about it yet just to see uh, if, if there's a preference or what kind of the, the weird nuances of the uh, English versus Japanese voice acting kind of brings to the table. Yeah, I I have a feeling I might watch the second part in Japanese just to see the difference for myself. Um, but I'll leave that up to you, Dayton, if which one you want to watch for the second part. <laughs> All right, we'll talk about that later. Uh, but for right now, let's go ahead and dive into the series, which kicks off with uh, episode one, Departure. And this episode begins the entire series with two soldiers driving through the desert at night during a windstorm. They appear to be hauling water through what they claim is demon territory when suddenly a mysterious creature begins appearing around their truck. This causes the soldiers to panic and they end up crashing. Pulling themselves up from the wreckage, a gaggle of dark silhouetted beings approach them. The soldiers open fire to no effect and one of them even gets their gun slashed in half by what looks like some sort of scythe. One of these creatures tells them to calm down that they're just taking what they have and the scene kind of zooms out and ends there. I really like the opening scene for this. I like how creepy it is. I like how it, like we're, I mean, they quickly say, mention demons. And, you know, there are obviously these like green eyed demons who intercept this truck and try to take things from it. Uh, but we don't really get a good look at them. We just kind of understand that they are, I mean, they crash this truck and they're taking something from these soldiers. Uh, and so it it leaves the audience with this, just a lot of questions. Like, I want to know what these demons are. I want to know why they're attacking these guys. Um, and I want to know what they look like and what they can do. Yeah, and this was, it. it felt really alien to me watching this because we've been covering Dragon Ball this whole time. And We've already seen a lot of the show before we even started making our podcast, right? So I already had expectations. I already kind of knew what to look for. And even when we're watching Dragon Ball content that I haven't seen before, I usually already know the characters and kind of have expectations. 
this was really bizarre to me because I'm taking notes and I have no idea who any of the characters are. I don't know what the rules are. I don't know if, I mean, for all I know, there could be like blood and guts and people could be getting their heads chopped off. I don't know what's going to happen. And so I'm kind of watching with bated breath to see what's going to happen here. And the setup is pretty well done because, like I said, I don't know what to expect. Those are all really good points. And I should also actually point out, too, that neither Dayton nor I have read the manga. Uh, I, I'm i probably going to try to do that before we do our second part of this coverage, just because I'm really curious about it. But to that point, Dayton and I don't know the story at all, and we don't know the characters at all. So this is like... This is new and exciting and interesting for both of us kind of experiencing this story as we go along. Yeah. And like when we flip over to this next scene, I don't know any of the characters and I don't know who's important. So I don't know who to focus on when I'm taking notes. And so let's go ahead and move over to a desert town where the old man sheriff is buying a pack of smokes from a small shop. We notice that the water is sold out in the shop and it's kind of teased at that it's quite rare especially when they flip over to the TV that's on in the shop and we see this king figure advertising his generosity by selling 500 milliliters of, of water for the discounted price of 17,500 yen. Yeah, uh, they, well, that's interesting. I want, did they say yen specifically in the Japanese in the subtitle? No, I just assumed it was yen. <laughs> oh, so the funny thing is they... Uh, at least in the dub, they call it Zenny. So it's still the same currency that they use in Dragon Ball. Really? They was... may have used that in in the Japanese then. I just didn't catch it. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just, I thought that was super interesting because that almost implies that it's the same universe or that it's like a, a splinter universe and Toriyama just decided to use the same currency. But I liked that little detail because that ties into dragon ball oh that, yeah that's super interesting okay so yeah they use zenny in this universe um but from there we flip over to the townsfolk gathering around the town's main well and it's revealed that this well's gone dry and that the surrounding towns have also had their wells gone dry as the folks sort of despair we see the sheriff kind of calming everyone down and it flips over to a scene where he kind of calms everyone down separates himself and we see a child running over to him with his arm full of these water bottles and it's revealed that he got these water bottles as generous gifts from the demons yeah this is interesting i guess as the audience we can start to infer that okay maybe that's what the the demons were doing who kind of ransacked this what looked to be like a military vehicle of some sort um but that still just gives us more questions like, okay, they're, they're considered demons. They're attacking humans, but are they like some sort of, you know, Robin Hood style vigilantes? Like, are they, are they stealing from the rich to give to the poor? Like what is going on here exactly? Yeah. And I mean, it doesn't, I think we go straight from this scene to the shot of the demons traveling in a caravan. And at this point, I still don't know, like, are all of them the main characters? Uh, I don't know who to focus on here, so I take notes as best as I can. Um, the the troop of demons, we see them kind of walking with a wagon of water bottles with them, sort of gleeful and happy that they've got their quarry. Um, we see one of the demons is this hulking centaur man with a sleeveless jean jacket, which cracks me up. Uh, one is this pink, spiky-haired, short little demon thing with a tail. Um, there's another one who's this short yellowish one with this wide head. And, uh, there's another one that looks like a pretty standard, like ghost wisp, but he has an umbrella. And finally there's this Fox thing that's carrying around like a scythe with him. So we've got a really just bizarre band of, uh, I don't know, creatures all walking through the desert together right now. Yeah. I'm glad that you stopped to kind of narrow in on these characters because, I love throughout this entire show so far. I love the character designs. They are very Toriyama in nature, but they they have such quirky little details. Like you mentioned, the centaur with the jean jacket. Uh, the there's the little guy that 
to me he looks like a he almost looks like a little weasel or something um but all of them have that kind of Toriyama charm it's very and it feels very authentic uh as far as like we've seen like Dragon Ball GT for instance it was like Toei animation creating characters in Toriyama's world and a lot of those character de designs don't feel like they came from Toriyama himself these ones do these they, I can't even really explain that. I don't know how to put my finger on that, but there's something that just feels authentically Toriyama about them. Yeah. The, the Toriyama has this weird way of taking something serious and then adding some sort of twist to it. That makes it a little bit more lighthearted. So these are all supposed to be demons, right? These are all supposed to be like monsters of the night or however you want to describe them. And all of them have, like, a quirk that, like, takes that darker side and makes it a little bit more lighthearted. That's a good point. That's a good way to to kind of try to synthesize what it, what it means to be, like, these Toriyama characters. And I think we kind of, like, move forward following these demons back to what seems to be the home of the demons. And best we can tell, it's more or less they just live in a bunch of rocks. Uh, but the the demon troop that we're following they're bringing this water these containers of water back home to share with the other demons and in fact uh there is one demon who is a slime i don't remember if they give his name but they're kind of concerned for the demon's well-being they're like hey he's not gonna make it and this little pink demon uh i don't think we're given any of their names up to this point but the pink demon basically like pours water onto the slime, basically rejuvenating him. Yeah. So we're seeing, um, they refer to him as the fiend prince. That's what we do here at this point. And we also find out that the fiend prince was also the one whose idea it was to give the water over to the human child, which we find out from the demons is kind of taboo. The demons and the humans don't get along is the impression that we're given. And after we see these kind of couple acts of kindness and we see that the demons are hurting, we see that the humans are hurting, we see the sheriff arrive at the demon encampment in his car, desert vehicle, whatever you want to call it. And we see that he's uneasy. He's even maybe even a little bit of afraid. But he calls out and he's asking the demons to, to negotiate with him. And that's when we see the pink demon, the little fiend prince, reveal himself as their leader. And we also find out at this point that his name is Beelzebub. Yeah, I love this. So, I mean, Beelzebub, I think kind of like a, I don't know, iconic name for like the Prince of Evil or whatever, some sort of demon, devil, whatever you want to call it. Um, so we're already getting like building on the lore and the world here a little bit. Uh, also, we we do kind of like in a couple of these scenes, we see a collection of more of the the demons and kind of like you mentioned, Dayton, the demons can basically be anything and everything to, to me. For anybody who's played any of the Dragon Quest games, a lot of the demons have they they look like monsters out of, straight out of the Dragon Quest game. Like there's this one that's like a, a floating scroll with eyeballs and there's one that looks like a big blue ogre with like a vest and stuff. They're very fun. I, again, character designs are phenomenal in this. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting because there's this negotiation between Beelzebub and the sheriff and he asks them for help. He seeks company on a dangerous mission to try and find a water source that he thinks is to the south. And as a sweetener for this offer, he gives them a very rare video game console to try and convince them to come along on the journey with him. Yeah, this is pretty fun. And we we kind of skipped over it, but they we see the, the demons playing with like a handheld video game console. It looks like a little Game Boy or something. So it, it's clear that this is this kind of caters to their wants and needs here. Uh, but like you said, Dayton, even in the, like where the character designs usually for Toriyama adds some sort of element of like levity or comedy to something that otherwise would be like dark and scary. 
I think that's that's kind of the same thing in their characterization here, where you're like, these demons are supposed to be scary and they don't get along with people, but they're just hanging out playing video games. <laughs> <laughs> and to make things even better, um, Beelzebub is kind of game for this, but first he needs to get permission from his dad before he can go along with it. I love this part. Uh, as I think we we basically move directly into Beelzebub going to speak with his father. And does uh, his father look like anybody to you? This is like a straight Dabura character design <laughs> rip, which is <laughs> hilarious to me. <laughs> I mean, he's got the goatee and everything. And on top of that, if if Beelzebub is the, the fiend prince, does that mean that his father is the fiend king? Yeah, I mean, which, the king of uh, the demons, <laughs> maybe some sort of demon king. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you know, can't be related at all. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was too funny. I was like, oh yeah, this is obviously Toriyama just having some fun with his work. It's very meta feeling, right? Like there's there's a lot of crossover here. Now we find that his name, the that Beelzebub's father's name is Lucifer, which I mean... <laughs> yeah, we're hitting the uh, the nail a little bit on the head with this one. Yeah, and I mean, his character design, as well as Deborah's character design, is very, like, traditional devil character, right? Like the red skin, the pointed ears, the black horns, slick back, black hair, black goatee. Uh, I think the only thing that is like, I don't know, maybe a little bit off model is the fact that he's also like massively muscled. Uh, I mean, I guess you see devils in different body types. What, you think devils can't work out? This one certainly does. He's got pecs <laughs> for days. Uh, it's funny, though, because uh, Beelzebub asks his father for, for permission to go on the adventure. And his father kind of knows about it already. Right. And he's like, yeah, yeah, you can you can go on the adventure. But I have one stipulation. And that's when you get back, you're only allowed one hour of gaming per day on the new video game console. Which is so funny. Like, this is. This feels like a modern day dad, like trying to dad their child, basically. Like, <laughs> clearly, I mean, it's, it's jarring seeing like like the demon king talking to the demon prince about video games. Yeah, I. You also uh, kind of get as the audience. I mean, you you get this impression that Beelzebub is afraid of his father in a way like he's he's very timid about going to ask his father about going on this adventure with this human and beelzebub up to this point has been kind of arrogant and boisterous and kind of you know he knows he's a big shot and he's that way until he walks into the same room as his father then suddenly he's like yes sir please sir like he's 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 definitely more in line when he's around his father and that's a good point that it uh, we we haven't had a ton of time with Beelzebub yet, but the time that we have had, he's very like he he's kind of the one who's running the show. Even though he looks like a child, he's kind of ordering around the other demons. Uh, he feels like very confident until he's in the room with his father. But his father gives him the pass to go on this little adventure. So Beelzebub agrees to go with the sheriff, but the sheriff's vehicle can only fit three people. So the demons are more or less coerced into auditioning for the third spot in the car, wh whether they want to or not. And they don't want to. All of them, in fact, express that they are not interested, but <laughs> Beelzebub is trying to find somebody who would be helpful or useful in this adventure. And so the demons start showing off their skills. We've got, I think, our, our little kind of weasel guy who has like a scythe and can slice rocks. And then we've got like a little goblin or imp who can fly but he flies super slow uh and we kind of get the impression that he might be sandbagging it so as not to get actually taken on this adventure 
Uh, and then there's... I, I love the centaur when he goes to shoot the arrow at the balloon and he accidentally hits it. He's like, oh, no, I didn't. Oh. <laughs> it's like, oh, shit, I didn't mean to. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's pretty... Everybody's sandbagging these auditions. Yeah. And well, finally, like, Beelzebub's being almost like... I don't know. He almost has like a, a a mentor, a guide next to him who's kind of, you know, helping him through all this stuff. And his name is Thief. And Beelzebub, you know, goes through everybody. He's like, is there anyone else I missed? And Thief's like, no. He goes, what about you? He goes, ah, well, you know, I'm I'm old and I got this bad back and there's no way that I could. And Beelzebub's like, all right, fine. I've decided. Thief, you're going to come with me. <laughs> and mind yeah. you you're looking at these other demons and you see people that could fly or transform or do all this crazy stuff. And he chooses like the old man next to him. It's really jarring. And this is, this is certainly played for comedy. Like uh, it, it's a curatory. It has a curatory. writing all over it. Right. Like he even so thieves character design too. Like he looks like an old man. The only thing that he is even, strange looking about him that kind of characterizes him as a demon is he has pointy ears beyond that he just looks like a a short old man who's like missing hair so you're kind of like okay what does this guy do but he does have the name thief so maybe that's a, a clue into what we're gonna find out he can do well we'll find out soon because the three take their leave the sheriff even being nice enough to let the other two demons learn how to drive his car as they start their adventure yeah, this is cool. Uh, it, I wasn't expecting them to kind of like get on as well as they did between like the human and the demons right up, right off the bat. But the the sheriff is, I mean, he's he's pretty open. He's like, hey, you guys could drive the car. I, I mean, I don't really care. And you kind of see them like driving through the desert, passing by dinosaurs and stuff. It's, uh, it's very. I mean, visually, it's very fun to watch. Um, and the demons are are loving getting the chance to drive this car. It almost feels like they're treating it kind of like a video game sort of thing. Well, and you almost see like a, a little bit of a smirk come across the sheriff's face. He's just kind of like appreciating almost the childish kind of nature of the demons and kind of just the, the raw joy that they're expressing. 100%. Uh, but that joy is cut short as we find the sheriff is sees a hole in the ground and he's like, we gotta go now. And that is shortly followed by this giant worm looking dragon thing leaping out of the ground and immediately attacking our vehicle, trying to basically trying to get in a quick snack. And I'd like to remind everybody that we are still in episode one. This is a jam packed episode of events. There's so much going on. And I, I mean, I, so far this has been phenomenal. Um, this this dragon worm thing is, I mean, the, again, character design, very, very cool. Uh, also I want to mention the music throughout all of this has been very good too, but our, our vehicle is like dipping and ducking and diving away from this, this dragon worm. And they're, they're heading straight towards one of these holes and they have some cargo on the back. And so the sheriff is telling, I think thieves driving the car, the sheriff is like, gun it gun it straight for that hole just trust me and he goes to the back and starts to unhitch their uh cargo and so with the cargo off they soar over this hole and the they escape from the worm i was actually worried this whole time that they would have to cut the weight and i wasn't sure if they would need to cut sheriff as a part of that weight or not because at this point, he doesn't even have a name. He's just the sheriff. So he could be somebody who is important or isn't important. And I was kind of holding my breath to see what would happen. It's honestly a very near thing because he almost gets left behind on the cargo, right? And I think uh, I think it's Beelzebub gives him a hand to kind of like pull him back onto the car. Uh, so he, he very nearly could have been left behind to be worm food. And this is um this is a very short lived victory too because while they do escape the worm, that cart was carrying all of their supplies, their food, their gas, their water, and so now while they escaped death by worm, they're facing death by the elements. And thankfully, the sheriff at least knows of a near ish by town that they have just enough gas to get over to. Right, and so our our protagonists basically head in that direction 
Uh, and as our episode is kind of coming to a close, we they basically end up hitting something and their their tires go flat and we see that this group of uh ruffians these these guys who are all dressed <laughs> up in like this clown regalia i don't even know how else to I, describe I don't know it. about you but i was getting some like ginyu force inspiration from this troop that's true they're they're pretty flamboyant <laughs> right uh mm-hmm. but they've got like pipes and clubs and they these these bandits are basically they're trying to steal whatever these guys have that is valuable uh and i love this scene because our old man sheriff pulls out some tonfa like a pair of tonfa like nightsticks for uh those who don't know but he just starts whooping ass man <laughs> yeah it's i mean you learn, um, because on this car trip over, there's this brief conversation between the sheriff and the demons, and the demons more or less reveal that, like, they actually don't kill people. Like, they're more or less mischievous, but they haven't really killed anybody. And to the contrary, the sheriff was actually involved in a war where he killed many people. So it's, there's this kind of, um, this ironic flip between the nature of these two groups that are sitting in this car, right? Like you have the human with tons of blood on his hands, and then you have the demons with no blood on their hands. That's a good point. That's that's a, a good character detail that I kind of glossed over too. And it, it plays into the moment here. In fact, Beelzebub, I think, almost seems like nervous when he finds out that our sheriff has killed a lot of people. Um, but you can tell the sheriff is... He's no stranger to combat because he's he's fighting like it's over half a dozen people, I think, at one time. And he's holding his own, like whooping their asses. I mean, honestly, he's more or less winning the fight, but things take a, a quick turn when um, one of them actually pulls out a gun. And obviously, uh, nightsticks are not a very good match against guns. And this kind of halts the sheriff in his tracks where one of the ruffians comes up behind and knocks our sheriff down hard with like a pole. Yeah. And this is where we get to see our demons shine, or at least kind of step in as Beelzebub like leaps in literally leaps into action. He's like, I'm a fuck you up. Uh, what did you but think that's about kind of the, um, the choreography for this fight scene. I wanted to talk about that briefly too. So first off, Tonfa, very underrepresented weapon period in media. So very cool to see them used here. Secondly, uh, I really like the way that they are used. Um, they, it feels realistic to the way that Tonfa are meant to be used. Um, funny enough, I think Dayton and I years and years ago, uh, did some martial arts with Tonfa, but it's very fun to see them. He's basically like blocking the poles and clubs, like on the forearm where the Tonfa are, are parallel to his arm. And then he's like delivering out punches with the, the very ends of the, the Tonfa right past his hand. And then you see him like flip the Tonfa to like slam somebody's head down, uh, really cool really well done he throws in a few kicks in here too to kind of like add to like he'll use the tonfa for blocking and then transition that into like a sidekick to kick the guy away uh really really well done i'm super impressed especially because we didn't really talk much about like the the animation yet this is kind of like a it's very dragon ball super superhero in my mind it has that sort of like cgi 3d animated but also is like drawn over top of the cg elements um it it feels like like the least offensive like cgi i've seen in a while like this is probably one of the best ones i've seen to date it's pretty good i agree with you so it, it it actually looks 
pretty fluid for being CGI as far as the fight animation goes. What about you, Dayton? What was your take on it? Um, so I thought the scene was it was pretty well done. Um, it seems like they did pay attention to like we're gonna animate this where it's like you block, you swing, and then you step, you strike. It seems like they were very focused on like a one, two, like an action and a reaction, the way they animate it. Um, and then they kind of string it together. I think for for just like a, a fight scene with some ruffians, I thought it looked pretty decent. It's nothing over the top, but it doesn't need to be. Um, so it looks good and it's every bit the fight scene that it needs to be. So it for me, it's like it gets all passing marks. I, I don't give it like extra credit, but I have nothing to knock it for. I think it's just a perfectly good fight scene. I agree. I think for me, too, it was it's very fun to watch a fight that is very grounded, like a, a fight in an Akira Toriyama of universe that is very just bringing it back to like just basic. I mean, if you want to call it martial arts at this point, this is like we're going to find out this is kind of like military training sort of fighting. Uh, it's fun to see it just brought down to that level. It, it's nothing crazy. It's nothing wild. It's nothing otherworldly. So I think for what it is, it's it's very well done. And I like that. Um, I will always say that the original Dragon Ball series had some of the best choreographed sequences in all of Dragon Ball. And when you bring things down, when it's when it's less extreme, you can focus on the small fundamentals, which I think in practice look fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Uh, that is kind of like the cliffhanger that we're left with on that episode, though, before Beelzebub gets a chance to enter the fray. Uh, did you have anything else about that episode before we move on to the next one, Dayton? No, uh, the next episode is episode two, The Royal Army Secret. And you are correct about Beelzebub because he just he just dives straight into the middle of the crowd of bandits and begins just slapping everybody around, quite literally. Yeah, literally, uh, like pretty much every bandit that he dispatches, it's a slap to the face. <laughs> I mean, it's I, funny. It, if anything, right off the bat, you start realizing that he's just having a good time here. Like this Beelzebub character is probably pretty strong if he's delivering slaps of justice. Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, one of them is is like a slap with his tail. Like, I think there's maybe one that he punches uh, just based on the animation. Um, it's pretty, it's a pretty quick sequence. There's nothing like terribly flashy about the way that he deals with these bandits. Uh, I, I can't help here in this particular moment when I was watching this episode, I couldn't help but draw some parallels here between Beelzebub and Goku. So what did you think about that, Dayton? Oh, like uh, when we first meet Goku at the beginning of Dragon Ball, where you've got this kind of young, powerful, like wild, unpredictable kid who's just kind of laying a smackdown. Basically, uh, in addition to that, too, just the fact that Beelzebub is almost like otherworldly strong, very similar to Goku. He also has, like, Akira Toriyama loves characters, main characters who have tails. Like, he has this tail that he uses in combat, too. Um, kind of like Goku in some instances. And it's it also has the parallel of, like, Beelzebub, we haven't seen a ton of it yet, but he feels a little bit naive to things in the world. Like, some of the because he's a demon, right? So he's kind of separated from a lot of the human world. Uh, so that also, I mean, we find out that Goku is literally an alien. So he's like, he doesn't understand the human world either. Uh, there's yeah. a lot of just little parallels there. I absolutely see a lot of Kid Goku and Beelzebub. They definitely feel like, I mean, not, they're kind of the same archetype. Like there's slightly there are some slight differences between their personalities, but they're very similar at the same time too. Like Beelzebub's fearless and will you know fight anyone with the super strength. Goku is kind of the same way, um, right? And on top of that, um, Beelzebub right off the bat has kind of revealed himself to be like a strong like fighter as a child, 
which is the, the same way we meet Goku when we meet him. And you're right about them both being naive characters or at least naive to the human world because Goku lived on a mountain by himself. And then Beelzebub has lived in like demon cities and hiding and hasn't really interacted with humans. So you get that kind of, you know, that they're being introduced to society sort of aspect to this. And yeah, I think if you want to compare Beelzebub to Kid Goku, I think there's more than just a couple um like sim similarities with their story arcs and their personalities too at this point. Yeah, definitely. I don't I and I don't say that as a bad thing necessarily. I just couldn't help, of course, making the parallels given that, well, one, we are a Dragon Ball podcast, but also that it's a an, an Akira Toriyama property too. Um but as we kind of continue the story, I mean that <laughs> as far as fights go, this is basically a non-fight uh he whoops the shit out of these bandits and now they basically just have to deal with the fact that they no longer have transportation their car it has flat tires from like a, a blade strip that the bandits set out for them and so they grab whatever belongings they can carry and they start hoofing it on foot towards the town that they were already heading towards um, and yeah, they've just got a little bit, they've got a while to walk as Thief continues to complain about his back. The, the complaining was kind of funny because, uh, Beelzebub kind of yells at him and he kind of gets himself in line and kind of knocks it off. But I don't know, I had a good laugh at that. Um, but aside from that, once they make it over to the, the nearby city, uh, the sheriff, uh, more or less tells them that they should probably stay outside the city and that he'll go in and do the negotiating and get the supplies that they need. But uh, Beelzebub tells him, nah, don't worry about it. We'll just go, we'll get Thief to run in there and grab all the things we need. And despite some slight protest from the sheriff, you know, because he is the enforcer of law and stealing is not exactly cool, um, he agrees to go along with it and... Thief puts on his stealing costume, which is a Santa outfit. <laughs> like his character design is perfectly suited for a Santa costume. This was not at all what I was expecting when uh, he was getting ready to get dressed up here. But he's basically expresses like, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm Santa. If somebody catches me, you know. I can get out of it by saying I'm Santa. <laughs> <laughs> I also think that like everyone's going to be looking for Santa if you get caught. And so the second you take off that costume, you're blending in again. It's almost kind of genius. It's ridiculous and genius all at the same time. <laughs> like I thought it was funny, but there is an argument for it. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, this is a gag that I actually really enjoyed. Uh, they don't, they don't, it doesn't overstay its welcome here, I guess, but he basically runs into the town and comes back and he's like, all right, I found a few things. I found food. I found uh, transportation. Particularly, I found transportation that's better than our current transportation. And we find quickly that he directs our heroes to a military tank. Yeah, and you would think that the sheriff would call them off at that point, but... No, they they decide that they're going to steal the tank and Sheriff grabs a bottle of hairspray, I believe is what it was. Mm -hmm. And he sneaks down to the tank and he stabs a hole in the side of it and throws it in screaming poisonous gas, causing the crew of the tank to flee. I like this, too. Like it's it's both most of the stuff that we've seen so far has been like well thought out and pragmatic while also being a gag at the same time. Um, like the, the hairspray was from thief thief is like very particular about the little remaining hair that he has <laughs> on his head and likes to keep it in a very neat curl on top of his noggin. And so due to thief having the hairspray, it let the sheriff use it as a fake bomb to vacate the tank. Yeah, so the crew flees the tank, the sheriff jumps in it, and the big guns are enough to scare off the crew. And so they load up what supplies they have and add it to the supplies that are already in the tank. 
And uh, we also find out that these tanks have like anti-grav stones that control the gravity in and around the tank, which I thought was an interesting thing. It's cool. It, it, it's it's like a weird detail, but it's really neat. I also want to point out too, before we get too far uh, past the tank stuff, one of the things I really, really like about Sandland is that we get we get to see Akira Toriyama's love for like strange monsters and worlds as well as his love for machines and vehicles and you really see that in the design and the the details of the tank it's 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 like a strange almost kind of like comical design for a tank but it's also really well detailed and fun to look at you know it i'm glad you pointed that out because even like the car that they were driving around in um like it doesn't look like a regular car it's almost like this weird i don't know like diesel punk like golf cart abomination that with like an awning that drapes over the top like it's it's hard to describe but it's definitely very unique it's funny because you don't really get to see toriyama's love for for like mechanical stuff and vehicles as much in dragon ball like you kind of get it with balma a little bit and with like the capsules and capsule corp but like the the manga covers for dragon ball there's so many manga covers that are just drawn with like goku on a motorcycle or something ridiculous that you would never see and i think it's just a Toriyama's outlet for drawing really cool vehicles and stuff because he doesn't get to do it as much as he'd like also, the tanks remind me of a uh, Metal Slug a lot, the older arcade game. But <laughs> it does kind of have that Metal Slug vibe. I didn't even make that connection, but you're absolutely right. I thought that was fun. That's what I thought of the whole time. I was like, you know what? I'm cool with this. Yeah, it totally, totally gives off that vibe. Um, but they they basically vacate the tank, uh, and then you we get the sheriff is like he gets into the tank and he's he drives it away and then he also mans the gun. Like he does all of this by himself. So this is kind of like, we're getting that sneak peek into the fact that he, he clearly has some sort of military training of some kind. Uh, and he uses the gun to kind of like scare off the soldiers. He doesn't shoot the soldiers, but he shoots near them to scare them off. He's very particular about not harming them, which is interesting. Yeah. And I think so far, um, we haven't seen anyone get killed yet. So even like when the demons were ambushing those guys in the desert, I don't think they killed anybody. So, so far it's been a very, uh, non killing affair. So the demons haven't killed anybody and we haven't seen the sheriff kill anybody, even though he says he's killed a lot of people. Right. Yeah. It kind of gives us the impression it's going to be maybe a little bit more lighthearted, which I mean, it, it, generally it is. Um, but as our, our protagonists are kind of like checking out the tank and assessing it and everything. Uh, the other, the, the demons kind of get in and the sheriff is like, well, we got to get out of here. I didn't care if we stole this because it was the King's tank and well, fuck the King. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. As an American, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He clearly doesn't, it doesn't have positive feelings about the king. And I think we're going to quickly find out why. <laughs> yeah. Um. So the crew load up in the tank and they head off into the desert. And while they're driving off, they come across this like flying fortress blimp thing. Um. Despite they reveal that planes are banned. And um, the sheriff... I guess kind of fakes being a soldier and greets this royal blimp of the the royal army and they radio down you know what are you what are you doing what are you doing out here why aren't you responding and the sheriff just points at the comms and shrugs and they're like oh the tank's comms must be broken we'll leave them alone and then fly off which I thought we've seen that in other shows and stuff but it, it is fun to see that kind of clever play yeah it's smart um we kind of see inside the, the the king's airship, there's this, it seems like some sort of general or something. Again, I love his character design. Uh, he kind of has the, man, I, I forget his name. He looks a little bit like the Carmine, I think. The, the guy from Dragon Ball Super Superhero because he has this 
massive like back curled pompadour <laughs> yeah. sort of hairdo with this big jaw uh it's just i love the character designs in this show they're so fun yeah and i mean <laughs> Like everything we see is just weird and different. Like I said, the weird blimp thing is weird. I don't know what it is, but it's a flying device. Their tank looks weird. Um, I mean, even just like the storage containers and stuff that they're hauling things around in are different. Like everything has like this flair to it to make it just a little bit special. That's a good point. Yeah, it, it makes the world feel as it should, like a little bit alien to even to us as well. Uh, but the our protagonist in the tank, they're like, we got to beeline it out of here. That was the King's blimp. They're quickly going to find out that we stole this tank. And that's exactly what happens is as they haul ass, the, uh, the, the King's blimp is contacted by the soldiers who got ousted out of their tank. And they're like, Oh, Oh, we got to go back and, you know, we got to, beat up those people who stole our tank. They, we can't let this happen to the king. Yeah, so uh, after being notified over radio comms, the vessel turns around and begins tracking down our heroes at this point. I don't know if they're considered heroes, but they're the main character, so I'll call them heroes for now. Sure. <laughs> um, and it doesn't take long for this flying blimp thing to track down our heroes, even though they're trying to like hide in the desert. And it's at this point that we see the sheriff kind of trying to get the crew in line so that way they can all kind of man this tank together. And I kind of like this, him taking that commander position and kind of whipping everybody in order. I thought it was like a lot of fun and also showing his experience as a tank commander or a military commander. I like this a lot too. Uh, and the, our demons don't have a lot of experience with this, but they are quick to kind of jump in line because this is their survival as they're being shot at. Uh, the, the sheriff quickly takes up the gun and fires, uh, kind of in the direction of the blimp and he hits rock and the, the general in the blimp is like, this guy's an amateur, but the sheriff used it as like a smoke screen to escape. Um, and he kind of like circles around the blimp and gets a clear line of fire to poke two holes into the blimp, uh, which to his surprise, spills out with water. Yeah, which it, in this timeline, that's like liquid gold flying out of this thing. And we see the soldiers kind of like despair over the fact that, oh, they punched holes in our, our water supply. What a waste. Like, they're like annoyed. And they begin like climbing up to the top of this weird blimp thing. And the entire bottom of it, like the bottom like... 80% of it is actually just like a big reservoir. And we see the whole thing just dropped off into the ground where it craters and explodes. And now we're just left with this much smaller flying device that looks like it's designed to hold those carrier vessels. Yeah. It, it, it's like a weird flying saucer with like these hooks for the, the water vessels. Um, but because that part of it did not take any damage, the ship continues to harry our heroes. Now they have these bombs that they're trying to like drop on top of the tank. And the tank is trying to maneuver out in the desert. I think thief is the one driving at this point, And the sheriff is just like giving him directions like zigzag, dodge that shit, man. <laughs> yeah. And the, the commander of the flying vessel even says that, you know, like it's a tank. It can't shoot up. We're just going to fly high and drop bombs on them. And that is a problem. A tank can't shoot up for now because thinking on their feet, they break away and buy some time in their tank to try and use the gravity stones to turn off gravity and get an angle. And they're only able to get the weight of the tank down to, I think it was like 1500 kilograms, an oddly specific number. Um, yeah. But this is where Beelzebub kind of steps in to help. And he actually lifts the front end of this tank up just enough to give them the angle they need to get a nice line of sight on that flying vessel once it comes into range and they actually fire a hole straight through it and send it plummeting to the ground. This is cool. I I like this. I like the tactical element of like the airship trying to get directly over top of the tank because it can't shoot up like they said. I like that 
the the sheriff is of course he's the one manning the the gun because he's got expertise but i like that the demons here both beelzebub and thief use their strength to reorient the tank to give it a shot directly up that it normally would not get so all of our heroes and their their strengths quite literally are coming to the fro here to give them an edge over the the king's army and the general uh, and allow them to kind of get a win where you wouldn't expect them to be able to. And Toriyama, I think, does this stuff fairly often where he finds reasons for everyone's strengths to kind of like work together to beat the enemy, right? And that's what we have here where, like you said, we get to see um, Thief driving the vehicle. We get to see Beelzebub's like, I'm guessing Beelzebub did most of the lifting on that tank. Like his Probably. strength actually lift that tank and then we see the sheriff's experience as a soldier and his his um, gunnery ability paying off here. Because I think they even mentioned that, like, the accuracy of his shots are kind of above the normal. That being able to hit a flying machine with a tank is pretty impressive. I think it's somewhere in here, too, that they mention, uh, probably right following the scene, because the, the ship itself, the flying ship, crashes... And the, the general is checking, like, did any of our men get hurt? And they're like, no. So they're like, he managed to shoot us down and not harm anyone. Like, that almost seems deliberate. And to do that would take significant skill. I'm getting some Trigun vibes here. I don't know about you. <laughs> that does feel a little bit Trigun, too. But yeah, it's <laughs> it's impressive regardless. Like, to be able to do that is real impressive. Well, now with the bad guy defeated, they kind of have some time to think and they kind of piece together that the flying device contained all that water, right? So they more or less are able to deduce that the king's water supply is likely the spring that they're seeking down here. That's where all that water from that machine came from. Um, they actually listen in uh, to the comms chatter around them as well. And the sheriff overhears that a familiar person is involved with this situation. The Sur Supreme Commander Zhao, who appears as this old man contained in some sort of mechanical peanut. I don't know what the heck that thing is. <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm going to keep harping on this, but I love his character design, too. Like, he's he's... In, like very old we're talking like he's looking like 80s 90s he's got like this tube running into his nose he's got one eye that is like it looks like it's uh been replaced with like a cyborg eye or something but he's just kind of like floating he's in this big bubble and he's got these t-rex arms kind of sticking out the front <laughs> of the bubble flippers. yeah <laughs> uh and he's got like some little controls on the front of it um, so he's, you get the impression that he's either this, this device is like keeping him alive, or maybe it's been com combined with parts of his body. It's kind of hard to tell at this point, but, uh, he kind of seems to be the head honcho of the King's army. Yeah. And I'm going to comment on later who this guy definitely reminds me of, but there's a certain moment that I need to bring it up at. So stay tuned for that. Ooh, now I'm curious to see what you have to say about that. <laughs> that does end uh, that episode, though, unless there was anything else you wanted to add. Nope, that takes us to the next one. Which is episode three, A Man Called Legend. And our crew decides to stop for the night listening to the radio chatter. And the thing that they overhear, which is concerning, is that the king has placed a bounty on the tank crew's heads. But... Thankfully, they haven't been seen yet, so they don't know what they look like, and they are only about a day away from their destination. So there's this kind of internal talk of, like, do we give up now while they don't know who we are? Do we continue forward? And Thief definitely doesn't want to be involved, but the other two more or less want to keep on the journey. Yeah, so Thief is kind of roped into it by default. We kind of cut away from that scene back to... Are and some of their names are going to be some of them are a little bit weird here, and I have a feeling they're pronounced differently in Japanese and, and English. I think I couldn't, I think they say his name in the dub as Supreme Commander Zeyu or Zeyao. It's 
it's very weird um but we get to see our supreme commander again in his peanut bubble <laughs> cyborg thing and he's with the king uh we see the the king is having a very arduous tough day inside the pool with his rubber ducky <laughs> yeah it, the everyone in the area is dehydrating to death and he's swimming in this big like body of water you Definitely get the vibe that the king is very disconnected from from the area and the people. One hundred percent. It's kind of hard to say at this point whether or not it's uh, malicious disconnect. Like he's he's clearly he clearly has access to an abundance of water if he's just got this big pool and he's swimming in it, uh, while the people of his land are. Some of them are all almost dying of uh, <laughs> lack of water. So, and we kind of find that, I mean, this is the the commander basically being like, "Hey, we've got a problem," and it's you know these guys who stole our tank. Yeah, and while all this is happening, um, we see uh, we see thief and the sheriff kind of chatting near the fire before they lay down to fall asleep. And um, they talk about the war that happened in the South with the, this is going to be one of those names, the Pikchi. I don't know how it's said in. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> but there was this incident with the Pikchi village 30 years ago and that the sheriff was actually involved in it. The sheriff, the sheriff thought that this was some sort of war against Pikchi Village to prevent some sort of super weapon from being completed that would destroy pretty much everyone in the area. But Thief reveals that they were actually developing a device to create water. And not only did the king want to eliminate the competition to his water, but um, Supreme Commander Zhao also wanted to get rid of the sheriff due to his questionable loyalty so he more or less planted some unstable materials in the village that caused an insane explosion when he launched his attack. Yeah, this is a big deal. This is, uh, I mean, we, we find that the, the sheriff expresses that he was the one who, who manned the tanks. Uh, he was the, the general who kind of like launched that attack. And so now he's finding out that, Oh, he didn't save Sandland from like weapons of mass destruction from the pitchy. He basically damned or condemned Sandland to a, a life of drought. Uh, because these, these pitchy or whatever they are called, they were, I mean, they were trying to solve the water problem. Um, and I, I don't think we get the full details yet, but we're going to later find out the full reasons behind why they did that. Yeah. And I do like the, um, the emphasis on the, the human emotion with the sheriff here, because he's, I mean, you could tell he went from, you know, thinking that he did his duty and he was loyal and he was a good soldier to, he enacted a war crime and just that regret that kind of runs through him as he's processing um, the fact that he's been lied to so severely and the act that he actually carried out. I, I don't know. I like this scene. Um, it's also adding a lot more depth to characters than I was expecting, especially seeing that this was such a short series. I'm surprised that they went into that much detail on something like this. That's something that I was kind of reading online is that people really like Sandland because it's kind of like short and succinct, but the characters have a lot of depth for something that is, is such a short series. So I, I agree with you. I really like the way that they're, they're fleshing out the sheriff. I feel like all of the characters have good and compelling motivations for their actions. And that continues to be the case throughout. Yeah, and I mean, I don't know. It's it's fun. It's a well done scene, and from here we also get um some interesting flashbacks of the sheriff, where we see, I guess, photos of him with some beautiful young woman, 
And it seems like um, he may have lost this woman and it was somehow related to all of this. So we see just all sorts of regret running through him. Yeah, 100 percent. We also see kind of the the explosion that happened when he when he attacked the the pitchy. um, He seemed he seemed to survive whatever the explosion was. So uh, he does. However, in the middle of the night, kind of come across Beelzebub, who is just like bathing in moonlight, or as we find out, bathing in darkness. He says that he's he's prepping for the battle to come and absorbing the darkness. And battle will come as the crew heads off in the morning, and we encounter our first set of weirdos in the show, which is ah. a bunch of guys in Speedos, one of which has just immaculate vision and is able to sketch the sheriff from like miles away these guys are wacky i i i I enjoy it they are they refer to themselves as the swimmers and there's like one of them is just this big buff old dude with a big mustache uh he seems to be kind of like the leader he's also wearing swimming goggles a speedo a cape and a, a skull cap um and it seems like the other two, like the the younger, smaller, kind of scrawny looking characters, uh, are revealed, I think, to be his both of his sons. And oh man, I didn't write down all of their names, but they all have like kind of swimming related pun names. <laughs> it was it was a really bizarre scene. I didn't know what the hell was happening. Um <laughs> I mean it's very Toriyama. It's very hey, we're gonna take what's the opposite of like the environment? Well, Okay, rather than having desert people, we're going to have swimming people because there's no water, right? I think you've mentioned it before that Toriyama likes taking something and turning it on its head. He, he likes having opposites. 100%. Uh, actually, I have a list of the characters. It's Pike and Shark are the two children. <laughs> I, I guess uh, I don't think the, the, the dad has a name. He's just listed as Swimmer's Papa. <laughs> it's so funny. But yeah, that's our... Our first set of truly weird and interesting characters standing in the desert with, like, swimming goggles and Speedos. This is wild. Uh, But, yeah, they they basically give a sketch of the sheriff to the, presumably, the military, the the king and his men, who then release a, a news story over the radio, like, hey, we figured out who stole our tank. And after doing some some further analysis of like the photo and some fingerprints, we found out that it is none other than General Shiva, who was the person who led the tank assault on the the Pichi uh, about 30 years ago and was believed to be dead, actually. Uh, And they they then say that they are offering a reward for either information or capture or uh, retrieval of the dead body of General Shiva. Yeah, and uh, with that announcement, um, we now know that um, there's a bounty out for the sheriff, and they have his name. They don't have the other um, names or images of the people so the demons right now are currently safe and the swimmers are in a race with the royal army to try and claim this announced bounty so the swimmers aren't necessarily working with the royal army they're actually kind of competing against them to make sure that they get the bounty and it doesn't get taken from them right so we almost have this this sort of third party here working uh working as their own entity um and this turns into the four of the the king's tanks show up on the scene um kind of like tracking down our protagonist and their tank they basically used a they gave one of the swimmers a tracking device and used it to track them down and now we're we're basically in full on combat at uh well actually I'm sorry I forgot because first uh general Shiva now that or 
whatever we want to call him now. The I'm going to call him General Sheev. Shiva. <laughs> yeah. He does have like a dozen names. I think we found out he was ca- calling himself like Ro or Rao, I think was the name he was giving. Um, I'll call him Shiva. But Shiva basically gets on the radio and says, hey, I'm trying to find water. I'm heading south to do so. Uh, I want to give that water to the people. Uh, so, you know, let me do my thing and I'm going to help the people. Basically giving like a big middle finger to the military and being like, I'm actually trying to help people here. I'm not trying to hurt people. And he also mentions um, kind of cryptically that he knows the truth about the Picti or Picchi incident. And this is important because the tank crew that's hunting them listens to all of this, including the commander from the blimp who's leading this tank crew with his nice little uh, swirly hair thing, whatever you call that. Um, Hell yeah. But he hears this and um, we see that uh, the kind of the, the counter to this is that uh, Zhao decides to just yell on the comms to, to not believe his lies and just continue forward with your order sort of thing. There's this keep your head in the sand and just do what you're told message in response to it. Yeah, 100%. Uh, I also wanted to point out, I was looking at something for the character design of Supreme Commander Zhao. He ha- I didn't notice this, but he, on his shoulder, he has like a rear view mirror that like sticks out off of his bubble. <laughs> oh, does he? I didn't even notice that. That's funny. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty phenomenal. Oh, um, that's sorry. super fun. <laughs> S- silly little tangent, but again, great character designs. Uh, but this turns into now a full on combat with these, these four tanks from the, the King's army. Um, and we quickly find out that Beelzebub also has very good eyesight and very good hearing because he's the one who basically like keys in on these tanks coming in their direction. And so this gives Shiva, our sheriff, the idea to be like, all right, Beelzebub, you're my eyes and ears. I need you to tell me what's going on. We're going to outmaneuver these tanks. Yeah, and so, I mean, once again, we're going back to the, everyone's going to kind of play to their strengths, as Thief is now just, he's still in the driver's seat, kind of listening to um, Shiva's orders, but it seems like he's a little bit more confident, or competent at this point, like he's kind of able to drive, even though he's still getting, you know, more advice than he knows what to do with, but um, we see the sheriff, or Shiva, kind of lead the other four tanks off in a race to prevent from being surrounded. Um, and they come across this big hill, which normally would be like a death sentence if you were to drive up it. And that's exactly what Shiva orders them to do. And so they fly up this hill and two of the uh, royal tanks turn the corner and start turning their guns towards our heroes. But they don't fire. And it's revealed that at the top of this hill is exactly where the sun is cresting, so it's almost impossible to see them with the naked eye. Yes. So, this is brilliant. This turns into them sitting there uh, just stationary on the hill, and the two tanks kind of like run up to that spot, and they're like they're trying to get a, a bead on where Shiva's tank is, but they just can't. And so Shiva takes that opportunity to fire on both of those tanks, completely incapacitating those two tanks um, and throwing, I think, uh, I don't know if we've given his name yet. I think it's General Ari, um, the guy with like the pompadour swirl hair. He's now like, who the hell are we dealing with? Yeah. And once again, though, um, no one's killed. These shots are pinpoint precise. They disable the turret. They knock out the treads. So the tank can't cause any harm and it can't move, but nobody's hurt in the process. And so once again, we have a, a trigun moment of it took a lot of skill to disable the tank without hurting anybody. Yes, absolutely. I think that pretty much ends that episode and takes us into the next one. Yeah, and that's episode four, Beyond the Sandstorm. And this one picks right back up with two tanks down, 
two bad boy tanks remaining. And this is where Shiva orders Steve to take the tank down the hill with speed. And we see these shots kind of impacting this hillside with plumes of, of sand and dust being like fired up into the air with each shot that hits the hillside. And we see them taking an advantage of um, kind of the speed that they're able to get. And this is where they're kind of drawn into another chase with our heroes. Yeah, at this point, too, Beelzebub takes it on himself to leap out of the tank and leap onto a nearby plateau where he can kind of better utilize his his eyes and ears. And we quickly find out that he can also communicate telepathically as he kind of like relays information from his vantage point back to Shiva in the tank. That's convenient. I wonder if he can uh, put his hand on somebody's head and see their memories, too. I wonder if that's going to I mean, up. maybe he'll do it just once and never do it again. <laughs> we don't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, the um, the two tanks pursue. And we find out that they've been, well, I guess we've kind of known that they have these fancy radar systems that they've been kind of been using. So they've been able to track Shiva and the crew, um, whereas Shiva's been using Beelzebub just for kind of like um, visual confirmation. And he's able to confirm this radar by driving quickly up to this like opening where the other two tanks are sitting and stopping right before he drives out. And um, the Royal Army tanks think that he's just going to continue out. So they fire into nothing, right? And so now we're confirming that they're tracking him with radar. And we see him kind of drive across. Um, and this time they don't fire. But unexpectedly, he decides to throw it in reverse and drive back. And this is where he eliminates one of the remaining two tanks, bringing it down to just Ari and his special tank remaining. I love this. So, like, it, it's basically this T-juncture, and you kind of get the impression that General Ari and his other tank have the jump on Shiva. They, they've, like, placed themselves there to fire on Shiva's tank as it goes by, they don't realize that Shiva's getting this intel from Beelzebub, who has already relayed to Shiva that the tanks, the the opposing tanks are in this position ready to ambush Shiva. So Shiva like tells Thief to like slam on the brakes. They fire their they shoot their load off. Um they don't really give they don't really express this, but it could possibly be that the the tanks, once they've fired, they now have to like reload. So it kind of gives Shiva the opportunity to like drive past, but then putting it in reverse and firing on them, they did not expect at all. So it completely catches them off guard. I really like the tactics that are used in this. They're very, very fun. Yeah, and the, the tactics actually don't stop there as now it's just the two main tanks remaining. And Shiva draws the, the final tank into a close quarters fighting area where he plans this like improvised trap where once it gets close, it launches into the air and explodes and it sends shards of metal and shrapnel like raining from everywhere. And this confuses the radar system as it picks up on all these metal bits around them. And using this confusion, Shiva guns it in from a weird angle, catching this tank off kind of off guard and once he's able to break that distance the the barrel length on this new special tank is longer than the traditional tank turret so shiva's able to get his turret on target but the special turret it can't get its barrel um in between them it, it sticks out past and so at this point he's more or less defeated yeah because they they basically slam shiva slams his tank uh into the side of general ari's tank so it's uh he full-on t-bones him and yeah like you said because of the length and the angle general ari can't fully turn like it turns and basically hits the top of shiva's tank without actually getting on target to be able to fire so it's full-on checkmate like this is what do you what do, what do you think about this the whole tank fight and sequence, Dayton? I want to hear your take on it. Um, I I actually enjoyed it. Uh, I mean, some of it was just like, oh, yeah, yep, yeah, like you use the sun, that's pretty neat, and then 
Like, okay, he figured out he had radar, like stopping right before you pop out. Okay, all right, that's pretty clever. There's a lot of just like, I don't know, just interesting thoughts that were put into this and just some logic that was just kind of taken to that next step. And the whole thing was fun. Um, I don't understand why he needed to end the fight with his tank right up against the other tank when he could have just shot and disabled it. But um, it was definitely just a different way to end the fight. And it, it was interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I see your point. Um, I mean, there's a couple different things that you, you could probably justify that with either, you know, the fact that he doesn't want to, to hurt people. And like, because of the, the smoke and the shrapnel, he might not have had like a clear vision or shot to be able to disable it without hurting people. Um, or, you know, I mean, who knows how much ammo they had. They didn't mention anything about that, but that could also be a concern. Uh, all of it's, I don't know, it's interesting. Like, I really enjoyed the tank fight. Once more, this is like getting to see Akira Toriyama, his idea of military combat, which, I mean, you could argue maybe the Red Ribbon Army, we kind of see that there, but that's even that is not really like, military tactics uh beyond i mean they were a military fighting like a little god boy so the tactics are a little different exactly exactly um so this is this is just very different than anything that we've seen uh i will say that the most of the tactics are are simple Mm -hmm. but they're logical they're practical they make sense like there's even a moment that we kind of glossed over where Shiva has the the general's tank behind him and Shiva just shoots some of the rocks to the side, which basically creates all this rubble that then the tank treads kind of like bounce over. And so General Ari, even though he should have Shiva dead to rights, because the tank is shifting on the rubble, he can't line up the shot correctly. And it's like, these are just very tiny little details, but they're all really well done and executed in my opinion so yeah, it's just it, real fun it's fun it's a fun fight like it's you're not trying to read too deep into any of this stuff right it's just like all right just enjoy what you're seeing on the screen like and you're gonna have a good time and that's what i'm doing right now this is just a fun little adventure that i'm going on and i'm not going to question the world too much and honestly it, it makes it really enjoyable like oh well why can't he get a shot off well well it's rocky out and tanks don't do well when driving over rocks <laughs> Yeah, uh, but kind of continuing forward with the story, these guys, uh, I mean, the General Ari and his men get out of the tank. They're like, hands up, we give up. You've completely outclassed us. Um, and they 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 kind of start having a conversation, like a dialogue of like, hey, what are you doing? Like, uh, what is your goal here? Why didn't you hurt anybody? And she was like, I'm not out here to kill people. All I'm trying to do is find the water source so that I can help give water to the people. And I think at this point it kind of comes up that Shiva's like, uh, is it Ari who mentions, I forget how it, it, it gets brought up, but Shiva basically expresses like, I know the details. Oh, it's because he mentioned it on the radio. Uh, Ari asks Shiva like, Hey, my father fought in that war 30 years ago with the Pitchy and was killed because of that explosion. I want to know exactly what happened. Like, if you know more about it, I want to hear what you have to say. And Shiva says, well, I, I learned about it from these demons. And Ari's like, eh, I'm not sure I trust demons. Yeah, it's everyone's kind of we're figuring out that everyone's kind of like intertwined a little bit here, right? Ari is the son of Apo, who was part of uh, Shiva's tank crew. So Apo was actually um, under the command of Shiva at that incident. And that's why he's so interested in what happened happened at the Pitchy Village massacre or whatever you want to call it. And you're right. It was that radio com chatter that kind of got um, Ari interested in asking. Um, and you're right about the demons too. The, he was very... Humans in general are distrustful of demons. I also find it interesting that most of the Royal Army already knows the names of um, Beelzebub and Thief. I don't know why, but it's an interesting detail that happens more than once in this. 
It does. So, I mean, you don't, they never really, I don't think they ever really express the why or the how, but I mean, you could kind of infer that it could be because the demons were stealing water from the king and his men. It could be because, you know, we've kind of, they've kind of implied that the demons incite mischief amongst people. So maybe there's like spooky fairy tales about Beelzebub is coming to eat your children or I don't know. They could make up any sort of crazy stories. Yeah. And I mean, we're going to work through this distrust pretty quick when uh, the swimmers decide to launch a blast at this little meeting that's happening. And uh, Beelzebub actually hears it. He picks up on the inbound round and picks up a rock and jumps into the way and basically saves all the humans' lives at this point. And this dispels any of the distrust that Ari had. Um, and we see Beelzebub kind of pissed off, go running off after the swimmers who try fleeing the scene after realizing the mistake they made, <laughs> which is pretty funny. So, um, and we actually get a pretty fun scene of um, Beelzebub going one by one to each of the swimmers and giving them each their own smack to the face. Yeah, this this kind of seems to be like Beelzebub's M.O., um, but he he chases each of them down, including the one who can run insanely fast. So we're we're getting a feel for all of Beelzebub's special talents. He's very strong. He's very fast. He can hear and see very, very well. Uh, and we're going to find he still has more to come as well. But while... All well, while Beelzebub's smacking around swimmers, Thief does give the full explanation to Ari about what happened. So now Ari's up to date on what happened to his father, but he's still he's still in that I don't quite believe it stage and kind of needs to test the waters himself, it seems like. Um, but he more or less believes the story that he's been told. Um, and Beelzebub. He goes one by one, smacks the swimmers around, and each of the swimmers has like a superpower. One sees really good, um, one's big, one's really fast, who can run, I think, specifically 180 kilometers per hour. And Beelzebub is able to catch or chase and catch this one. But in doing so, he ends up like kind of really far away and off their current path. And while he's there, the sandstorm blows in that causes him to have to duck in and take cover. But while he's taking cover, he stumbles upon something interesting. He does. Uh, he stumbles upon... Well, it... Something next episode. Yeah, uh, we kind of... He, he telepathically communicates to his friends like, hey... Come this direction. I have something to show you effectively. Um, the one thing I really like here at the end of this episode is that Ari actually contacts the king and he bases out um, who was really involved in the pitchy incident. And he learns that this whole thing was actually Commander Zhao's machination. So the king actually didn't give the order and probably didn't have really anything to do with it. Yeah, he he asked the king directly, like, hey, did you give this command? And the king's like, no. Um, and I think we we do. I think we get just barely like the the one shot reveal of what Beelzebub found at the very tail end. And it looks to be a spring of water. Yeah. And I'm just going to jump to the next one because. Mm -hmm. Well, the next one is episode five, the terrifying insect men, which mm -hmm. I uh, just seeing that name was like, I don't know how we get there, but OK. Um, <laughs> also, it's, the uh... in the intro, um, we didn't talk about the intro, but the intro has a bunch of the insect men in it. So I kind of knew what we were encountering. Yeah, and anime intros tend to do that as far as spoilers go, as well as, as we've talked about, the episode names. I I don't think that I'm overly upset about that uh, spoiler, necessarily, it's though. It's fine. Like, I mean, 
Dragon Ball has some of the most spoily episode names I've ever seen. Yeah. Like, we know that there's going to be conflict, and if we know that it's insect men, like, I mean, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> I mean, it's better than, like, you know, Goku beaten by Cell? Gohan next? Question mark? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Those, I, I'm pretty sure that is, like, almost a verbatim episode title. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Uh, but anyway, uh, we... We show our heroes kind of admiring, or I'm sorry, uh, you were right about uh, Beelzebub kind of directing our heroes um, to where this oasis is. And we get a shot of our heroes admiring the o oasis, postulating that the king likely banned planes to keep people from finding water reserves like this one, which I love. That's such a nice little detail. To be like, oh, planes are banned. And you're just like, that's weird. And then there's actually a very reasonable explanation for it. It's, I don't know. It kind of blew my mind a little bit that it was that well thought out. I I like that a lot, too. Uh, and I don't know about reasonable explanation. It's definitely a, it's logical within the world, but it's not reasonable to ban planes so that people can't find water. <laughs> well, I mean, we did learn that uh, uh, he still uses like planes. He just doesn't yeah. like his his vassals. Like you don't fly. You like you can take cars. You can do whatever you want. But planes are, you know, they're they're bad for the environment. They it's a lot of CO two. We can't have it. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like there there is a, like questions and concerns. Like because the king does have his own flying devices, but nobody else is allowed. So it's like okay. <laughs> so yeah, it, we find out that it's clearly so that people don't find water for themselves. Uh, but Beelzebub here hears movement, hears people, and he quickly like moves towards and finds a little hidey hole filled with the the pitchy people. And for anybody are who they knows like these Aquaman or something like that. Are they called Aquaman? Is that yeah, what, what was the name of the I thought they were called like Aquaman or something like that. Maybe, and that that could also be a difference between the Japanese and the the English dub because I I don't remember them calling them Aquaman, but they did use they there was something that they were making they that they called like Aquin or something yeah. like that. I can't remember. It was something like that. Um, or I'm getting some things mixed up. I I don't know. It's my first time seeing it, and I saw it in Japanese, so I did probably didn't understand everything perfectly. <laughs> Yeah, for anybody who knows the names of everything better than we do, we apologize if we mispronounce them, but we're both going off of, I'm going off the English, Dayton's going off the Japanese, and these are all new names and characters to us, and some of the names are a little bit wild. That's so right, we're, we're a doing professional our podcast. This is professional quality right here. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and it's kind of a, a a big reveal because at this point we thought that everyone from that village, the whole race and everything were extinct. And so finding kind of a, a little hideout of them w w was an amazing discovery, especially since it's, you can kind of deduce that this little oasis was probably their machination. They probably actually created this since this was the technology that they were working on. That could be the case. Right. And this is this is interesting. Um, we kind of shift our focus away from the Oasis back to uh, some military comms between Commander Zhao and General Ari. And uh, Commander, or I'm sorry, General Ari further does some investigation here, asking Commander Zhao, like, hey, you it sounds like you were the one who gave the command to like destroy the pitchy people uh what happened back then like i i want to know the the truth i want to know the details yeah and zao is not hearing any of this one he's pissed off that he talked to the king without talking to him and two he basically tells him to shut up and just follow orders and to maintain the peace so Commander Supreme Commander Zhao basically dodges the entire question. And for me, I think this this is the moment that pretty much um, confirms for Ari that the Supreme Commander or the story about the Supreme Commander and Pitchy Village um, is all true. That 
they lied to him and that thief was telling the truth about what happened. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, I mean, he, he didn't necessarily trust the demons, but he, he did his own investigation to confirm and see if the demons were telling the truth. And he kind of came to the conclusion that that is the case. Uh, we kind of cut back now, now that he's had that epiphany to our protagonist and, Beelzebub kind of reveals to Thief and Shiva that, you know, the pitchy are here. Um, Shiva's like, if that's the case, I I want to leave this oasis alone. I want them... I've already done terrible things to their people. I want them to have some peace and keep their oasis. It's, it's theirs. Um... We're just going to leave and we're going to try to get away from here as quickly as possible so the king and his men also don't find it. Yeah, and uh, it's funny because Beelzebub basically says, like, yeah, I knew you were going to say that, so I'm on board. And so it's not even, it's not an argument. They're all kind of on the same page at this point that they've gone through enough. We're going to pretend like we we never saw them. And so the, the pitchy are more or less left in peace in their little... Probably self-made oasis. Yeah. Uh, Shiva even gives like a little bit of a, a a bow and like a little prayer or an apology for everything he's done, even though they really have to get out of there quickly. Um, and they, uh, let's see, moving on from there as they... Well, the Royal Army is still in pursuit of our heroes and we see that they're kind of like keeping tabs on them with like aircraft or something. And this is where they discover the demons working alongside Shiva. And uh, speaking of Shiva, this is where we learn that his first name is Rao or Ro or something like that. There it is. So he more or less uh, tells everyone, all the demons, his now friends at this point to start using his, his first name, which is Ro or Rao. Um, and Beelzebub tells him to stop referring to him as Prince and to start using his name, which I've been doing this whole time. Uh -huh. but everyone more or less becomes better friends at this point because they've, they've just gone through so darn much. That's right. I also kind of like that, uh, I'm going to keep calling him Shiva just to make things easy. Uh, Shiva calls Beelzebub Beels, like gives him a little nickname and Thief is like, can I stop calling you Prince? And he's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> servant? You're still a servant. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, the Supreme Commander Zhao gives the order for Ari and his... Uh, not Ari. Yeah, it is Ari. Yeah. Ari and his squadron to return home. Um, And Ari contemplates this for a moment, realizing that he's likely being called back for punishment. Um, and so he just opens up comms and then announces to all the guards at the water source that they are relieved from their duties and then describes the location that the water source is at in case anyone forgot where it was, but that it's super duper secret and don't tell anyone. I love this. This, I mean, once more, like people just getting on comms and giving Commander Zhao and the, the, the King's army, the big middle finger, like. Uh, and even Thief is like, don't these idiots understand we can hear them? And uh, Shiva's like, no, no, this is deliberate. Like, this is very clearly on purpose. Uh, so Ari definitely trying to to help Shiva in this instance. And that kind of gives Shiva like, okay, I guess we're following the river south to find the king's water source. It's also really interesting, too, because of the... Um, similarities between uh, Shiva and Ari um, where they were both Shiva was a low level commander when he was in the military and Ari is currently kind of a low level commander or general in the military and we mm -hmm. see Shiva who's you know was in that role kind of his main combatant at this point is somebody who is in that role so it is kind of interesting to see that dynamic between those two characters. It's a really good point uh, that Shiva is is almost like the 
he's been through what Ari's been through. So he's kind of seen the other side of it at this point. Uh, and we kind of shift over to a, a, a scene which is going to be uh, key, keying us into our title card for this episode here as Commander Zhao is like, we need the insect men. Get them ready now. I want them to attack Shiva. Uh, I don't want anything happening to the water supply. And these like scientists are like, the insect men aren't ready. They could attack anybody. And he's like, I don't give a shit. Put bombs in them. Give me the detonator and we'll be good to go. <laughs> I love it. Also, I, I do like... Uh... From now on, using the phrase, we need the insect men instead of saying we're in trouble, because that is such a better way to put that. Um, also, like the freaking science facility thing that they're at is like this big, tall, weird looking building that then sinks into the ground after he asks for it. Like, I don't know what the hell is going on. I don't know what this building is, but it's, this whole thing's freaking weird. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. But yeah, I, I presume that's, I don't know, some sort of defensive measure. It's like, oh, hi, but... I, I'm at the building with the insect men. It just goes underground. <laughs> yeah, it is kind of wacky. Um, but our our protagonists in the tank, they, they make their way south following the river, as Ari told them. And they eventually come across a bunch of wash towers. And they're like, okay, we, we've got to be close. And so they eventually find this structure and it's right in the middle of the dried up riverbed. And they're looking at it like that's not a normal base. That's a dam for the river. Yeah, we at this point, it's pretty obvious that the king or at least his army walled up all the water that should be reaching the surrounding area and has been using it for himself. I mean, on the other side of this dam, it is, I mean, it's an immense dam. It's the biggest, it almost looks like an ocean, the size of the yeah. water source that's sitting behind this thing. And they decide pretty quickly that, yeah, we're, we're going to destroy this thing and let water go to the rest of the region. Like it should be. But before they're able to, this is where, uh, the ground begins to quake and pulse and the sand begins to rumble and that weird ass science building begins to emerge from it. <laughs> it's so funny. I almost didn't even like register that that weird ass science building did that. But well, it's such a normal like Toriyama thing to do that if you don't step back and look, you won't realize how weird it is. Yeah, I it didn't even register to me at all. So it's funny that you you pointed out that detail. Um but yes, the weird ass science building basically like lifts up out of the sand and it, it almost looks like it's it's like this floating device. And I think Shiva actually points out that, oh, this, this is probably the detail that you were maybe referring to, Dayton, because Shiva's like, oh, they they're using they call it like the Aquin something or other. But it's the Aquin technology that the the pitchy created and that's what's allowing this massive base to kind of float up into the air yeah it's i mean i love the tie in that like every time they build a little bit of lore they draw something from it so it's it's very i don't know elegantly written well uh to not only punctuate that this weird building that goes underground and now flies uh or, but it also um is like a military base too so it has like guns and turrets all over it and so it's also some sort of war machine this is the weirdest building i think i've seen in a while in a show because it does <laughs> everything it flies through the ground it's a science structure um big reveal uh on top of the cannons it's gonna launch missiles containing bug men here in a second but that's just a little bit of a spoiler um this is a weird ass building but yes what <laughs> uh, Zhao reveals himself from this floating building, does some taunting and shit talking, and then this is where the bug missiles are launched. <laughs> the way you describe it makes it sound extra crazy. And to me, I was just like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> I mean, I'm definitely, it's not important. Like, my points aren't important about this building. It's just really weird to me. Yeah, that's, that's pretty funny. Um, but for whatever weird 
science they've been doing a science. these these like pods that they fire out at our our protagonists uh split open to reveal these slime covered insect men they they kind of have i i don't know best i could tell they they kind of have like this praying mantis vibe to them uh but they're they're big and they've got like these claws at the ends of their hands and they move forward to attack our protagonist and she was like we gotta go we gotta get in the tank yeah so the sheriff or shiva or Rao or Ro, he quickly scoops up the um the crew and carries them back to the tank because i believe oh that's right beelzebub actually steps forward to fight one of them and you know he's kind of cocky he's like flexing he's ro rolling his arms over like yeah i'm gonna smash some bugs well a single punch from one of the bugs which it's funny that he get punched by a bug um mm -hmm. just sends him like flying and sprawling and basically knocks him out and this is where shiva's forced to scoop him up and grab Thief, and that's where they get back to the tank, and they begin trying to flee the scene because it's looking pretty bad. Yeah, Shiva gets straight popped in the mouth, uh, and then they start driving away in the tank, and the bugs start to, like, get on top of the tank. Like, these bugs are supercharged. They can they can run fast. They're very strong. Um, they, they manage to kind of, like, close the hatches and start firing on the bugs, uh, but there's there's so many of them that they they can't take them all out, uh, and and the bugs start to like leap onto the tank and just start like pummeling it, putting dents into it, and you can tell that given a few more moments, the bugs are going to break through, and they full on like lift the tank up off of its treads um, to to stop the tank, and our our heroes look like they're in quite a bit of trouble. Yeah, but thankfully. Uh, Beelzebub's better now, and he kind of gets his composure back, and he marches back outside, ready to start round two with the bugs. And that leads us right into our next episode, which is episode six, The Fiend Beelzebub. Yeah, this one, I mean, starts with Beelzebub. I mean, he's ready for action. He goes straight to it. He, like, leads the bugs away from the tank, and this is, I think this is really like our first true fight scene with Beelzebub. The other ones have just been him like slapping the shit out of some people. This is, uh, I mean, he's throwing like full on donkey kicks. Uh, he gets knocked into the dirt uh, a couple of times by punches. He's throwing headbutts and haymakers and uppercuts. Uh, this is This is pretty fun to watch to get to see him like, go full out against these bugs. Yeah, there's even a, a decent sequence of shots where we see our, our little prince fiend or fiend prince um, slinging a, a high kick around into a bug's head, then follows that up with a guard against a kick that was coming back at him that sends him sliding back on his back foot. Then we see him step up and off the leg of one of the bug men to push up into a kick that he delivers back. And while he's flying backwards through the air after delivering that kick, this is where we see a bug like jump up and like soccer kick him, like spinning soccer kick him into the mountainside. It's a fun little sequence. And I don't know, I had to take notes on that because this, I like that original Dragon Ball fight sequence feel. And there's a lot of that to this. It very much feels that way. Yeah any of the action in this that they like really focus in on has been very solid, uh, especially I would say for the, the sort of CG animation that they're, they're working with here. Um, and this kind of leads into Shiva firing on the bug men from the tank, trying to back Beelzebub up and both thief and Beelzebub are like, don't, uh, Beelzebub doesn't need your help. Uh, we need to focus on taking out Commander Zhao. He's the real problem here. Yeah, and Shiva struggles with this because he's watching, at this point, one of his friends just kind of get circle beaten as he, at one point, is even lying on the ground. Um, all the bugs just, like, stomping and punching him. And so it's tough for him, but um, eventually he does kind of give up or give up that notion and continue forward 
And we even see Beelzebub be lifted up and impaled by the clawed hand of one of these bugs. Um, but Thief continues to tell him not to worry, that everything's still all right. And, I mean, it's it's interesting because this feels like a Dragon Ball trope. Uh. Because we're going from the, kind of this this low point, right? Where you're overwhelmed and you're on the verge of defeat. And Beelzebub goes from that to screaming in anger. We see red flash across his eyes, steam pouring from his nostrils as he grits his teeth in anger. And there's almost kind of this aura of energy that begins to kind of appear around him. This is very Dragon Ball at this point. I mean, this is fully like, Beelzebub's Super Saiyan equivalent here, right? Like, as you said, this this plays into the Dragon Ball tropes 100%. And I like, too, that they already kind of alluded to this. Like, we had the scene with Beelzebub at nighttime being like, I'm absorbing the darkness for the fight to come. So it, it also doesn't come out of nowhere, which I like a lot. Uh... And this turns into a full-on ass whooping for these insect men. Uh, you even see, like, when Beelzebub goes to punch one of them, he almost, like, teleports. It almost looks like an instant transmission sort of thing. Uh, as his, his nice speed... <laughs> hey. <laughs> as his speed and power has, like, vastly increased. And he also, when he gets punched by the bugs at this point, he full-on no-sells it. Like, his head just turns like a Vegeta sort of deal. And then he just returns with his own punch, knocking them back into the rocks. Yeah, and, I mean, this is... This is a smackdown, right? Like, he... If he takes a blow, his counter blow is ten times as hard and it sends these bugs that just sprawling onto the ground. And... Zhao panics. He screams for all the insect men to attack. And through the unrighteous smackdown, we see everything they do kind of fail. Um, there's even a moment when the bugs whip out their weird blue tongues and they pin down uh, the, the fiend prince. And it's at this point we see him erupt in this red demonic energy that defeats all the bug men simultaneously. Yeah, this is cool. Again, this is like a like a Dragon Ball, like aura blast that shoots out from him. The only thing that I will say that I would have liked to have seen more of in this fight. And I don't know if this is a limitation of either the CGI or just the fact that this is geared more towards like a younger audience because these are just insect men. These are basically monsters. This would have been the perfect time for Beelzebub to just rip them apart, like dismember them, rip their limbs off, see like purple blood or whatever, just get flung about and just be super visceral and over the top with the violence. But we didn't quite get that, unfortunately. I was kind of expecting it to. It does get a little bit gruesome, though, because with the defeat of the Bugmen, we see Beelzebub trying to speak with one of them, but before a conversation can really happen, this is where Zhao triggers the detonator and the bugs begin to explode. And all that's left is a crater and the fiend prince lying motionless in the center. Yeah, I think Shiva sees this as Shiva and Thief are trying to kind of infiltrate the the wacky underground floating base and Shiva's like, he's, he's dead. Like we gotta, we gotta do something. Um, and thief is like, don't worry about it. He'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. I love how thief is just like, like so nonchalant about all this, like watching his prince just be stabbed and brutally beaten and exploded. And I guess this is probably just another Tuesday for a demon. Yeah, I mean, this just seems like the norm for them. And, uh, I mean, she was, she was pretty upset, but their thief pushes Shiva to be like, hey, we we need to take care of Commander Zhao. Don't worry about the prince. Uh, we've, we've got our own goal. Uh, the prince is kind of giving us this opportunity. And so they, they kind of continue to infiltrate full-on Death Star style and... We we get some of the soldiers now trying to 
to stop Shiva and Thief. And it, it turns into a bit of a firefight. There's kind of a funny moment. I don't think that we touched on this, but Shiva previously had mentioned, like, he carries a gun with him, but he had told the demons that it doesn't have any ammo in it, uh, that he, he didn't use it because he doesn't, he, ammo's too expensive to actually keep around. And then he fires the gun and, like, hits uh, an air valve or something to distract the guards. And Thief is like, what the hell, man? You said it didn't have any bullets. And he's like, well, I didn't know if I could trust you. That <laughs> <laughs> It's pretty funny, especially because they really didn't trust each other at the beginning. Yeah, which which shows a lot for their, their character growth in a very short amount of time. Um, but Thief basically tells Shiva, hey, you go ahead. I'll take care of this. And the next scene with Thief going through the ship and just throwing poop bombs... I like I don't even know what to say about it. It feels very much like a an a Toriyama gag, but they're literally spike poop bombs of poison gas. <laughs> well, I think he's kind of stealing the um uh Shiva's idea with the tank from earlier where he threw the hairspray and said it was poison because I think um they were using the poop bombs earlier to try and set the mood in an earlier scene when Shiva was being walked through the um the Demon King's lair. So I think they're just smoke. I, and I think it's just kind of poop smelling smoke is all it is. You're right. Yes, that's that's a good point. Because, yeah, these were used more as a gag. They're not actually dangerous. They're not real poison gas. And, yes, that's that's a funny thing is that Thief actually took that, like kind of learned from Shiva. So we're seeing these guys kind of like integrating each other's tactics and really trusting each other, which is fun. Yeah, and it's great because Thief is buying time for for shiva to go ahead and take care of business which ends up uh on the roof of this big facility where shiva is now in a one-on-one -on -one situation with the floating mechanical peanut supreme commander zhao and um zhao is upset because he's asking shiva why he would disrupt the peace that he had worked so hard to spread across the country. So he's almost making himself out as the hero and Shiva is the terrorist, which I kind of like that, that arrogance and that just kind of like dastardly look on the situation. It's so interesting. Like it, I like that they on some level try to set up the bad guy as like, even though he's clearly a terrible person, he's potentially like views himself as like, no, this is, this is good for people. I've, I've set up the monarchy has control of the water. Uh, there's peace because people, I don't know if he thinks that people aren't fighting over the water or whatever, but I mean, he's so detached from what reality is. Um, he's almost like the, this... the means to an end kind of guy where it doesn't matter how many eggs do you have to break? It's just as long as we make the omelet. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Uh, and this this disagreement uh, in in terms of ethics here turns into a full on firefight as our cyborg commander Zhao's peanut belly flips open to reveal <laughs> these two Tommy guns, and he just full on like Gatling fires at uh, at, at Shiva who can only return fire with his little pistol. <laughs> yeah, and she was kind of like jumping and ducking for cover and avoiding bullets as best as he can. And his little pistol just bounces off the mechanical peanut. So it's not even really that useful. And he's kind of like forced back onto like some ledge and scaffolding. And he's more or less at the end of his rope when he dives onto like this crane and swings around. And he's kind of uh, lost track of it amongst all the scaffolding. And this is where he finds kind of an exposed flank on Zhao while he's being looked for. And this is where he fires a couple of his own shots into the vulnerable machine gun belly of the mechanical peanut. And now Supreme Commander Zhao is gunless? Presumably, yeah. Uh, as, I mean, it seems like Shiva has gotten the the advantage here. We kind of watch as Commander Zhao's like hammering the buttons with his T-Rex arms trying to get it to fire and uh it is not working, but he does have the advantage of minions as he kind of calls on the the 
military personnel uh, tells them to, hey, shoot this guy. And they they basically try to. Shiva kind of like taking cover from the, the shots. Uh, and while this is going on, Commander Zhao is getting ready to deploy a bomb directly overhead of Shiva, to which Shiva like jumps out and says to the, the military guys who are firing at him, get away. You're going to get blown up. Yeah. And Shiva, I believe even takes like a, a round here, like to the shoulder. He's kind of knocked back, but um, before Zhao can drop his bomb on his quarry from off screen, we see something pierce through the mechanical peanut kind of shattering out the side of it. And this is where we find out that um, Ari has actually arrived and he fired a tank round through General Zhao. And this moment kind of saves our hero and these soldiers from potential bombing as Zhao sort of sputters down to the ground, kind of bouncing off of it and his bomb bouncing off to the side, exploding kind of revealing to the soldiers that they were going to be caught in the crossfire if he was allowed to do what he wanted to do. Yeah, 100%. And so the the soldiers now are like, I mean, this Shiva guy tried to save us. Uh, so they, Shiva says, hey, this is between me and Zhao. I'm asking you not to interfere and the soldiers stand down. I mean, they they've already seen who had concern for their well-being, which was Shiva and who certainly did not in Commander Zhao. So it's at this point that I realize that um, Supreme Commander Zhao reminds me of a blend of Baron Harkonnen and Dr. Robotnik. I don't think I know the first one. Baron Harkonnen uh, from the Dune. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, yeah, and you know what? I mean, when you say Dr. Robotnik, man, I'm shocked that I didn't make the Dr. Robotnik connection because, yeah, with his little pod that he's in, it feels very much like Robotnik's little uh, little pod that he flies around, like dropping bombs and stuff. <laughs> I was thinking, yeah. I was just like, this is very Dr. Robot. The bomb part is very Dr. Robotnik. And then just like the disgusting decrepit creature in like a floaty suit is very Baron Harkonnen. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good call that this is kind of uh Dr. Baron Harkonnen mm -hmm, here. Mm -hmm. Um, that's funny, but yeah, he, he basically kind of like comes to a skidding halt on top of the, the military base. Uh, his, his peanut basically not working anymore as he turns around. I think he gets one of the soldiers to give him a gun. Yeah. <laughs> and so with his little T-Rex arms, he's like firing shots at Shiva and Shiva just shoots the gun out of his hand, then shoots the leg out from under his peanut so that he's just lying helpless on his side, his T-Rex arms unable to do anything. And Shiva's got the gun pointed right at his head, ready to pull the trigger. Yeah, and Zhao is pleading for mercy, which I think, if anything, just just enrages Shiva that much more because how many people did, did he not show mercy to, right? And we see Shiva's eyes open up as the camera zooms out from the situation, and this is where the gunshot goes off with like a moment of silence and the birds flying by. And once we zoom back into the scene, we see that Shiva actually spared Zhao's life. And it almost looks like Zhao kind of goes unconscious from the the stress of the situation. But turns out that that whole thing was a ploy. And uh, Dr. Robotnik had pulled his little dinosaur hands inside of his little peanut suit. And is just tapping away and little buttons inside of there, which causes his pants to fire off his peanut thing. <laughs> and we see a rocket is revealed and he tries to escape. I, I love this because it's so freaking ridiculous. I love this too. He literally has a rocket shooting out of his ass uh, as the little peanut casing comes off. You see like these he, decrepit little legs just like poking out the bottom. 
Yeah. Now it looks like he's wearing a Robotnik diaper uh, and he's like flying up into the air with this detonator in hand. And he reveals that he still has the detonator for all of the insect men. And he's like, I'm going to blow all you motherfuckers up. And at this point, Beelzebub leaps into action, uh, full on, like going to take out King Piccolo style and like gives uh, Dr. Robotnik a punch straight to his cyborg eyeball and full on launches him into the atmosphere, Team Rocket style. <laughs> Actually, I have the Team Rocket note here too. So, yes, that is very accurate. Uh, Zoud got Team Rocketed off the map. Like he's gone, he's done. Um, the day is saved. And at this point, everyone gets together. And all we have to do now is just tear down that dam. And uh, after some tank shell shots and even the swimmers show up and get involved, they're able to knock over the dam and water starts pouring out and peace and happiness appears to be restored throughout the land. Yeah, more or less. Uh, this feels like a this... complete story right here, doesn't it? It certainly does. Uh, I mean, we kind of get like the little bit of resolution with with Ari, like Ari saved the day he kind of came to like kind of like you said Dayton where uh Shiva had already seen the the terrible things that the monarchy and the military were doing and now Ari has kind of come around to that um and now that the the water's kind of been restored I mean our our heroes can kind of go back I think they give a little bit of an announcement too that uh the king is going to offer up a bunch of his money to the people but yeah, this is this basically is the whole resolution. I think that ends our episode six. And um, but there's seven more episodes to go. <laughs> yeah, so it feel it feels like the end of the show, but we're only we're not even halfway through it at this point. Um, so I mean, I'm curious. Like the only other note I have is that Ari more or less takes the spot of supreme commander for for the royal army, but. Other than that, after the credits, um, there is a scene of a girl on a bike um, who appears to be following like the flying underground fortress thing. Um, but I don't know what any of that's about. I was going to ask if you if you saw the, the tail end there, because I I almost missed it. I almost closed out of my my window of watching Sandland before that very tail end, because it's like the last five seconds of the episode uh and yeah it's it's this woman with like blonde dreadlocks and she's on a motorcycle chasing after the base so i mean it's it's like a very subtle hint into whatever the next arc is going to bring here uh in addition to this these six episodes are i think dayton you mentioned it at the very beginning are basically a it's like a cut up or a not really a remake it's a cut up of the movie that was released in 2023 and released as individual episodes that then got continued as a series through the next 7 episodes that's interesting so i'm i am curious if you are going to read the um the manga how it cuts up and if it's if it's as cut and dry as this is, because this, this feels like a, a full story arc end. Like you could stop making um, episodes at this point and it would feel like a completed story. 100%. I'm probably between now and our next podcast episode, I'm probably going to read through the single volume that makes up Sandland, And then that way we have, uh, we can discuss and talk about like the, the differences and a little bit of a comparison. Uh, I do know just looking like at little bits and pieces of the manga, I do know that the woman that we see at the tail end of this arc is in the manga for sure. So I know it at least covers some details with that character, but I know almost nothing beyond that. Yeah, it's, I mean, I have nothing to go off. I have nothing to postulate at this point because there's no... Um, there's no open end. There's no real clue as to what happens next. Um, but so I guess I'll just comment on everything we went over so far. And 
I gotta say, I didn't know what to expect coming into Sandman. Um, or Sandman, Sandland. Um, <laughs> Enter Sandman. Uh, Hell yeah. And I don't know what my expectations were, um, other than unsure. But overall, it was a, a fairly, I think it was a fairly good story. It was coherent. Um, they gave me enough reason to care about the characters. And one thing that I walked away thinking is that uh, I feel like with the original Dragon Ball, um, Goku is the main perspective. It's interesting that they go with the perspective of the old man in this one. And I wonder if that correlates with kind of Toriyama's age, whereas when he made Dragon Ball, he was younger. And then now, because this this is a much more recent um, uh, manga and anime. Well, shoot, the manga came out in 2000, so it's not that recent, but still. Um, yeah. So I'm wondering if he's kind of telling these stories from his perspective in life. And that's why he's kind of choosing these characters to focus on as he's making these shows and series. Yeah. I mean, he still would have been, gosh, I think in his forties when he made Sandland. So he wasn't, he was no young man by that point, I suppose. Um, and that's a, that's a good point. Like most of his run of Dragon Ball would have been years and years prior to Sandland. Um, this though, for me, I really enjoyed it. I, I like, like you kind of mentioned that the characters feel fleshed out. They're not terribly deep, but they at least have concrete motivations for their actions. They're, they're all kind of interwoven in terms of their stories and they're, they're connected in ways that make them feel like there's it makes it feel like there's enough drama to really like sink your teeth into as the audience member and it it has some messages based on based on greed it has some messages based on uh prejudices with the demons um and kind of overcoming those things like uh defeating the the greedy monarchy overcoming prejudices between the humans and the demons and so it's it's definitely like by the end of it it's definitely a feel good sort of story there's not a lot of like dark elements here um and yeah i think honestly my my only real issue with it is that i mean we are we are on the older side of the spectrum for watching this. This definitely leans towards a a younger audience, I would say. And that's really my, I don't even know that that's really a complaint necessarily. It's just watching it. I'm like, okay, I could do with a few darker elements, but I can tell this is definitely a lighthearted story for a younger audience. I definitely felt the same way where, um, like, this is something where, like, if I had kids, I'd be like, yeah, you should watch this. This would be, you know, a great starting point for, like, Toriyama's work for you. Um, the the word that keeps coming to my mind, if I want to describe it in one word, is just, I think this this series is cute. I don't know if, if you thought the same thing, but it's kind of, like, wholesome and just, um, I mean, the lessons are are pretty broad. It's, you know, like, oh, this is a greedy person. He's very greedy, and so that's bad. This is a controlling person. He's very controlling, so that's bad. And right. oh, don't judge people by the way they look or what you hear. And just, like, there's a lot of just good general lessons in this that are hard to disagree with, and I don't mind that. It's, I mean, it's the same reason why I kind of love, like, Lord of the Rings, where, like, the bad guy is obviously a bad guy. and. Right. Uh, you go on an adventure to beat them. Um, so there's some just simple um, elements to this that I can just sit back and appreciate. Um, I don't need to read too deeply into it because I think the lessons are kind of on the tin and I'm fine with that. Um, at least now at the beginning, I didn't know where to set my expectations at, but now that I understand that it's kind of um, a lighthearted adventure, I can just sit back and enjoy it. And I don't need to read too deeply into things. Like I don't need to nitpick this to death because it's not trying to be that. 
I very much agree with you. I Like I said, I really enjoyed it. I don't have a lot in the way of critiques beyond the fact that it is just probably... I, I don't think that I'm necessarily the target audience for it. Uh, but it, it's even with that in mind, it's still something that as long as I, like you said, as long as my expectations are set, I can just turn this on, watch it. I don't have to think too hard. I can just sit back and enjoy it. Honestly, it's it's it, it's a feel good story by by the end of it. Uh, by the time that they like defeated Commander Zhao, I was like, yeah, fuck that guy. <laughs> it was very cathartic. I'm like, yeah, he's a bad guy. Get rid of him. See, so, and I probably wouldn't. Um, this isn't going to be like in my top list of favorite anime or anything like that. And um, I'm this isn't going to be the first one I go to if I'm going to sit down to watch one. But like, if my wife wanted to watch this, I would gladly sit down and watch it again with her. Like, it's it's a decent watch there. And like you said, I don't have any major complaints with it. And once my expectations are set correctly, I'm I'm just having a good time. And fuck Commander Zhao, I agree. <laughs> yeah, I. I don't think I have a ton more to say about it. Uh, I I guess a couple of little things that I we didn't touch on a whole lot. I briefly mentioned I like the music pretty much throughout. The music was it was always appropriate for the scene, which is more than I could say for DBZ Kai. So it's it gets points there. Uh, I think the opening is fun. It has like this this like upbeat rap song for the opening. Um, so I mean good job on the music the the animation for what it is for the cgi stuff like you said dayton i think you maybe mentioned it as like the least offensive cgi that you've seen which is a pretty good way to to identify this uh that's a it, compliment it, for me because i don't like cgi typically and this one doesn't bother me i'm not going to give it compliments because i still think it's going to age poorly but it looks about as good as i think you could make it I agree with you. I think I'm a little bit more lenient on some of the CGI stuff, uh, but I I definitely agree that for the time frame right now, this is definitely one of the better ones out there. I One thing that I will say about the CGI stuff like this is that the more that I think on it, I don't like the fact that everything has to be so... Some of it just feels a little stiff and rigid compared to actually drawn or animated anime because you can go so much more expressive. dynamic and yeah expressive and off model and you can definitely tell even when they're trying to be like like during the fight scenes or during like scenes where they have to show a lot of emotion you're like i feel like they could do more with that if it was drawn rather than like on the cgi models yeah it's I feel like you're always going to miss some artistic flair when you go with the CGI stuff. There's always going to be an element that's missing, some personality that should be there that isn't. Um, so, I mean, it's... Like I said, it's it's fine. I'm not bothered by this, but I don't think CGI ever ages well. And I also think it's it's missing some oomph that could have been there if you actually let artists kind of express themselves with these scenes and um, the animation. But yeah, I mean, it was it was perfectly fine. None of the fighting looked bad to me, but none of it really stood out as like great to me. Like there were some good fighting. It looked good, um, but it wasn't like some of the the moments in Dragon Ball where there's tons of like attention, a little detail about how they they cock their foot in a certain way and the way they place their arms like um, for a hold or to break a hold or something like that. There's just there's that little bit extra that a show from uh, 30-ish years ago has over this brand new one that just can't be replicated in CGI. Yeah, that's a good point. And yeah, even though I said I, I'm a little bit more lenient with it, I I very much agree with you. And, and the more that I watched this, even though I was like, oh, this CGI looks really good, the more that I was like, I feel like they could have done more with that shot or that scene. Like it could have been tweaked just enough to make it look more, more dynamic and really like capture the, the audience's attention. Um, but for what it is, I, I was, I was very impressed with the CGI used for the show. And fighting isn't and, the focus of this, right? This isn't Dragon Ball. And I have to remind myself of that sometimes that 
even though it's Toriyama, we're not watching Dragon Ball. We're fighting is kind of the 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 main template that we're going to be using to tell the story and express emotion. Like this is different. There's actually more storytelling elements involved in this, and um, I, I guess it's also a show about driving tanks. So that too. Hell yeah, I really liked the tanks. So. <laughs> it's fun. Um, it's actually fun. Yeah. So yeah, I I mean, there's a lot. Honestly, there's a lot of good here. I I don't really have much in the way of bad marks to give the show at all. The the worst ones basically being like, uh, yeah, CGI limits you a little bit and then it's definitely targeting a younger audience. We're not the demographic. But... So I I like you said I'm not going to ding it for that um because yeah, it's <laughs> I can't complain about something not being designed for me because it's just not designed for me. That's just a thing, right? Exactly. Exactly. I I think this would be like sit a couple of of children between like I don't know eight to 15 in front of this show and they'll probably love this show uh i think it's i think it's perfect for that demographic also uh the tanks would make awesome toys to get kids like they'd be incredible i wonder if they have those in japan we should do some some searching for those because yeah those would be super cool (laughs) (laughs) i would want one of those (laughs) oh yeah that'd be cool as hell so yeah uh design style and everything great um characters great story great um i mean it's overall just a good show it's just in some ways it's not my cup of tea but i'm not gonna ding it for that um like i said it's just i'm not the demographic and it's that's fine that's perfectly fine i like a little bit more fighting my shows too um but it's about tanks which is perfectly fine (laughs) so yeah full marks for me um yeah so if you're if you haven't seen Sandland and you're into something that's a little bit more lighthearted, maybe a little bit more, I'm not going to say kid focused, but young adult focused, maybe it could veer into kid a little bit because there really isn't anything that's over the top violent or gory or anything. Um, but yeah, it's a wholesome, cute show. I don't know how else to describe it. It hits the marks that it's trying to hit perfectly fine. Yeah, I I completely agree with all all of that. I, I don't have a whole lot more to say. Do you, is there anything else that you wanted to discuss, Dayton? Uh, no, because I think um, I'll probably have more to talk about once we finish um, the entire series, which is only seven more episodes, by the way. So this is part one and part two. Because um, once I see how it all comes together and like, are we going to grow up a little bit more later on or are we going to stay with the same notes? Like, what's how are we going to punctuate everything we've seen so far? I have a lot of questions. Yes, me too. I I was looking too. I was trying to find if they had a name for this arc and I couldn't find one. I was kind of like trying to come up with names in my head. I was like, you could call it like the drought arc or the water liberation arc or <laughs> the commander Zhao arc. But I do know that the second part of this show is the forest land arc. How so did you I'm find curious. out the name of the second arc, but not the first one? Wouldn't, I... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Wouldn't they be know. like right I... next to each other? You'd think I was <laughs> digging and I could not find anything. I don't know if it's just supposed to be the Sandland arc and then the Forest Land arc, but I I don't know. I I failed to find the name of the first arc. Well, I guess it um, is weird to name the first arc when the first arc is just a movie. Um, but the movie's just called Sandland. Uh Okay, that is difficult. God damn it. Why is exactly. every, why is the naming of everything in Dragon Ball so freaking confusing? I know, and it doesn't change in Akira Toriyama's other properties either. So, <laughs> oh gosh. All right. So, well, <laughs> thanks everyone for tuning in for the blank arc. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but yeah, I think that's going to be it for this episode of Instant Transmission, oh. where we discuss everything Dragon Ball and. Sandland? <laughs> okay, I was wondering <laughs> if you're going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> this has been your host, Todd. And Dayton. Don't forget, we're on Patreon and Twitter. If you want to help the podcast grow like Krillin's hair, I'm pretty sure I had that in an old one, and I keep forgetting to change those. <laughs> you can find time. us. Also, what, of course, <laughs> it's a joke about Krillin that you keep forgetting about. That's right. Everybody forgets about Krillin. <laughs> Uh, you can find us at patreon.com slash ITDB podcast and over on Twitter at x.com slash ITDB podcast. 
Our podcast episodes come out every other Monday morning, so you can enjoy some Dragon Ball or Sandland goodness on your commute. Please like, review, and subscribe on whatever podcasting platform you're listening to us on. Thank you all so much for your support. Thank God, there's so Be much sure that to... goes into this. Dear Lord. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, it's almost like we're pros or something. <laughs> uh, be sure to join us next time as we dodge poison poop grenades in part two of our coverage of Sandland. Supreme Commander Zhao has been defeated. The King's Dam has been broken and water has re been returned to the people of Sandland. But many questions remain for our heroes. Will the humans and demons be able to set aside their differences? Who is this dreadlocked woman on the motorcycle, and what does she want with Shiva? Will Thief get a new can of hairspray for his immaculate hairdo? Find out a next time. And to all our fellow Dragon Ball and Sandland fans, stay safe out there, and remember to keep rocking the dragon. And Alex, yes, we do read the comments. We're just terrible at responding to them. <laughs> we are the worst of social media. <laughs> oh, God, please forgive us.